On what would have been Dr. King's 57th birthday, the Great Hall of the Hubert H. Humphrey Building overflowed with people who came to remember the great American best known as one of the founders of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Dr. King was remembered through song and prayer. The Secretary of Health and Human Services was there to summarize what Dr. King accomplished before an assassin's bullet claimed his life 18 years ago. The ideals for which he stood and the ideals for which he prayed motivated millions of Americans to join his nonviolent movement that shattered segregation. The keynote speaker, Dexter Scott King, was the fourth and youngest son of Dr. King. In an emotional speech, he recognized the significance of the new holiday and of the man, his father, in whose honor it was created. For the first time in the history of this great nation, we are honoring a peacemaker, a designer, and a messenger of nonviolence, a drum major for justice, love, and righteousness, who was a native son of America and who began his career as a civil rights leader in Montgomery, Alabama. Under his leadership, nonviolent protests brought about the greatest social change in the history of this country. His leadership lifted a heavy burden from this country where others preached hatred. He preached and taught the principles of love, nonviolence, and a patriotic commitment to making democracy work for all Americans. It wasn't until January of 1982, after years of trying to have a holiday set aside for Dr. King, that his widow, Coretta Scott, and other civil rights leaders succeeded in persuading the Congress to pass the legislation creating the special day. It should be a day, however, not marked by commercialism, but rather by a simple remembrance of his life's work. I think that the greatest gift that we could give him would be a gift of love, a gift of peace, a gift of unity, a day when we should all reflect on the teachings that he so, so frequently talked about. In Washington, John Myers, America Today. Perhaps the high point of Dr. King's drive to achieve civil rights was the moment he stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on the Mall in Washington and spoke to the nation and the world. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. 22 years later, officials of the National Park Service, which administers the Lincoln Memorial, have commemorated that special day with a wreath-laying ceremony honoring the slain civil rights leader. Director of the Park Service, William Mott, said there'd be other special tributes to Dr. King. Each of the 337 sites that comprise America's 80 million acre network of national parks will offer the visiting public this week a special exhibition commemorating the contributions of Dr. King, sensitizing our society toward mutual understanding and respect, freedom and justice, love and peace. This occasion is appropriate, a day for our nation to reach out and pay tribute to a man who awakened the best qualities of the American spirit. From an empty podium, the words of Dr. King were repeated with a message that still stirred the onlookers at the ceremony. When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. If on the eve of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, the Reverend Jesse Jackson revisited the dream of over 20 years ago. He warned students at Washington's Howard University not to get lost in nostalgia, but to remember that King's vision occurred during the turmoil of the 60s. We must resist 
this weak and anemic memory of a great man. For to think of Dr. King only as a dreamer is to do injustice to his memory and to the dream itself. The so-called I Have a Dream speech right here in Washington on March, August 28, 1963, was not a speech about dreams and dreaming. Read the speech. He was describing nightmare conditions. He said, we paid our dues and been given a promissory note only to find out that it has bounced and come back marked insufficient funds. Jackson says American blacks are still paying their dues and that it's time to demand justice in the enforcement of voting rights legislation and in the way the Reagan administration makes its moral stances around the world. Jackson told the students they have the power to make changes. How do you observe his birthday? Register and vote. How do you observe it? Say no to drugs. Say no to alcohol. Say no to babies making babies. Say no to violence. Say no to apartheid. Say no to South Africa. That's how you honor him. Jackson says to remember Martin Luther King only as a dreamer is a disservice to the slain civil rights leader. The first official national celebration of King's birth, says Jackson, should remind all Americans they have a responsibility to eliminate social injustice in the U.S. In Washington, Bob Petrick for America Today. At the end of 1963, the country was mourning the death of President Kennedy, and civil rights leaders feared the movement would be set back. But the biggest victories were yet to come. On July 2, 1964, Martin Luther King stood behind President Johnson as the first part of the Monumental Civil Rights Act was signed into law. Later that year, King won worldwide recognition as the youngest man ever to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. At home, President Johnson was lobbying Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act to end tactics designed to keep black voters away from the polls. And in Alabama, King led a five-day march from Selma to Montgomery to press the voting rights cause with Governor Wallace. By the end of the summer of 1965, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. These were triumphant days for black leaders, but tragedy was just around the corner. In February of 1968, black sanitation workers went on strike to protest unfair treatment by the city. They called for an all-out work stoppage, and King was there to lead the demonstration. But mixed in the group were black militants who started rioting and looting. In the violence that followed, a 16-year-old boy was killed. Many were hurt, and nearly 300 were arrested. King was shaken by the events. He was receiving death threats, and friends said he knew the end was near. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. The next day, King was assassinated. A life dedicated to peace ended in violence. We gather here this morning in one of the darkest hours in the history of the black people of this nation. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! The president traveled to southeast Washington to speak to some youngsters at an elementary school named for the civil rights leader. Mr. Reagan praised Dr. King for his leadership in making America freer. Martin Luther King Jr. was right to insist that the civil rights movement be non-violent. And he was brave. Your teachers won't approve of my using the word I'm going to use now, but I have to. It's the best word for it. It takes a lot of guts not to hit back when someone is hitting you. And he had that kind of guts. He was a great man who wrested justice from the heart of a great country.
and he succeeded because that great country had a heart to be seized. Martin Luther King Jr. really helped make our nation freer. It's not a perfect place. We still have a long way to go. There's unfinished business, and we can't rest until all prejudice is gone forever. The president told the students the nation is different and better because of Dr. Martin Luther King. Our country is different because Martin Luther King Jr. made it better by the way he lived his life. And that's why Dr. King's birthday is now a national holiday for everyone in the country because his contributions benefited all Americans. A bust of the slain civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, was unveiled in the U.S. Capitol. King is the first black American to have his sculpture in the Capitol. It took an act of Congress. A special House Senate resolution was passed five years ago calling for the King bust. 200 sculptors wanted the assignment. Boston University professor John Wilson was selected. I tried to do something that uh, not only was a physical likeness of him, but something that suggested some of the uh, kinds of um, the, Im the intangible uh, character of his personalities, his spirituality, his, uh, his eloquence, and his sense of compassion for, uh, for all people. The bronze bust, one and a half times life-size, was cast at the Paul King Foundry in Rhode Island. Wilson says he selected the New England Foundry because he's worked with Foundry director Paul Cavanaugh in the past. He has done and cast a few other works of mine, and I found him a uh, very knowledgeable uh, person in this field. Wilson is pleased with the finished bust. He's convinced he's created a sculpture that people for all time will be able to understand what Martin Luther King meant when he said, I have a dream. Stu Nagurka for America Today, Washington. One who marched with Dr. King in those years is former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Andrew Young. Mr. Young is now the mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, and believes Dr. King's dream has been fulfilled. We're really celebrating the fact that this nation that's made up of a great deal of diversity, people from many racial and cultural backgrounds, uh, found a way to come together as one nation without violence. With Martin Luther King's leadership, we adopted a notion that we could redeem the soul of America, that we could make America respond to its black minority just as it had to other groups who had come to these shores as immigrants. Uh, and I think that we've done it with some degree of success. Dr. King would have been 57 years old last week. He commands us with his life and in his death that, yes, we should sit down at the table of brotherhood, not only as an American family, but in this world house, for injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And that was the old George Wallace. Uh, it kind of turned loose a reign of terror on people and we felt that the only way you ended that reign of terror was to get a political system that was responsive to the citizens of a community so we went to selma deliberately trying to find a mechanism to get our voting rights protected by the federal government selma is the focal point selma is the heart of the black belt selma is a symbol of the resistance to the right to vote. And for that reason, I will have to be here to march with you tomorrow morning in Selma. We've had in our area here outside agitation groups of all levels. We've had Martin Luther King, uh, King pardon me, sir, Martin, Martin Luther King. 20 years ago, I was a very young white man, 34 years old, and I was possibly what you would call a redneck that had come from a poor background, and I had fought the white structure, the old South, to get elected, and then all of a sudden this whole thing hit Selma, the black movement, the Voting Rights Act, and I was thoroughly disgusted with it. Smitherman was a young mayor then who had very little influence. It was almost as though he'd been elected 
uh, to kind of give a good image to the city. Uh, but the city was really run by Jim Clark. The Board of Registrars is not in session this afternoon as you were informed beforehand. You came down to make a mockery out of the courthouse and we're not going to have it. Under Alabama law, the sheriff is the highest elected official in a county. He even is higher than our police department. And the governor even was had to take a lot of mess off the court because it was popular what he was doing in those days. He symbolized the old uh, plantation slave master. I mean, it was his role and his conviction uh, that you just had to beat some sense into these niggas. He read the political winds wrong, and he put on a good act. He had a helmet liner like General Patton and a big swagger stick, and he had formed under state law what you called a posse. And they had the riding posse, the walking posse, and they would form around him at the courthouse. And Dr. King and his staff would do everything we told them to march through the city to get to the courthouse to provoke him. It made good news. And it got their, their demonstrations on the national news every night. The purpose of our demonstrations was to state the case for the right to vote on camera. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. You can turn your back now and you can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down justice. And we will register to vote because as citizens of these United States, we have the right to do it. Well, Jim Clark lost his temper and uh, beat C.T. Vivian on television. We did not anticipate that, nor did we deliberately provoke it. And of course, it did help our cause. I make no bones about that. Once Wallace and Jim Clark showed on television what they were really doing. Uh, they created such a revulsion in the American people that it made it easy for us to get change. This is Derek Moore. As part of America's remembrance of Dr. King, Washington, D.C. presented a dramatic view of the civil rights leader's sacrifices and achievements. Thousands of people gathered at the city's Martin Luther King Memorial Library to witness the unveiling of a large mural portraying King's life. It's not just for black people to remember. It's for all Americans to remember. Because Dr. King was a leader, not of just black people, but a leader of all Americans, wasn't he? And so we've come this day with a mural that grew out of the determination of an artist to use his talents and his skills and his emotions, but also the faith of a people to do something notwithstanding the fact there was no money there. The King mural documents the leader's great influence on American society from the early days of the civil rights movement in the 1950s to King's assassination in 1968. The painting was the idea of Don Miller. I hope that it will be here as an inspiration to others as it was to me while painting it. Uh, frankly, I had a deep affection for Dr. King, a profound gratitude for the work that he did attempting to lead this country into a more just society. My respect and admiration for him developed as I painted the mural. The painting tells the story of the major events in King's life. The bus boycott which first made King a national figure. The jail where King wrote some of his most memorable thoughts. The march on Washington when King delivered his I have a dream speech. The Nobel Peace Prize which King received in 1964 the men and women who died in the struggle for civil rights, and finally, the gravestone in Atlanta, Georgia, which reads, Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last.